So this is uh, on Florida Trail in the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. And where is that? <clears throat> some of you may know, some of you may not. As you can see, it's right here in the Big Bend of Florida. And uh, <clears throat> so just as the peninsula is turning into the panhandle, it's called the Big Bend. So it's out in the Gulf of Mexico in this big bay here. And uh, there's many designations for protected lands by our national government. And they're a little bit different in purpose and uh, they report to different departments. So I thought I'd just go through that a little bit. What's the difference between a national park, a forest, a preserve, and a national wildlife refuge? Well, national parks, of course, we're familiar with, but there's also seashores, national lake shores, national monuments, and national riverways. And they all <clears throat> um, report to the National Park Service, which is part of the Department of the Interior. And so they're like the original granddaddy of our conservation efforts in the United States. And so their purpose was really to conserve these areas, but really to make them available to people, you know, for recreation in a controlled way, in a way that preserves the, the, the natural environment. But they're definitely made to, to be accessible and for people to visit and to, uh, to enjoy, you know, um, and recreate on, the, on those premises. Uh, as part of that, they've also designated what's called a national wilderness. So some areas within these national parks are designated wilderness. And, and some of these other areas are, are that way too. <clears throat> and this, this national wilderness is a little stricter. It's designed to retain the primeval state without any human habitation or machines. So if you have a national wilderness, you're not allowed to build on it or even go and bring in machines. For example, there are some national wilderness areas along the Florida Trail. The Florida Trail is maintained by volunteers, but in those wilderness areas, we can't bring in any machine, you know, any powered like grass, grass cutters or loppers or any kind of uh, chainsaws, anything like that, because it's a wil national wilderness. So everything has to be done by hand. Second one is the National Forest. That, that's a part of the US Forest Service, which is a part of the Department of Agriculture. So this is a little more commercial in origin. It was originally just to preserve the nation's forests so that we wouldn't completely exhaust that important national resource and because uh, we could conserve forests, but it's, it's geared pretty much towards, originally towards, um, towards silviculture and towards the timber industry. Um, and to kind of save it from itself. But of course now it's more of a preserve, but it's always got that kind of commercial bent to it <clears throat> and agricultural bent to it. Then there's a national preserve, which is kind of a hybrid, which is developed out of the park service. And uh, this is where they wanted to do national parks. They wanted to preserve the area, but there was already significant human activity in the area. And so, they had to kind of carve out a place for the, for the human activity to continue, even though uh, they had a preservation goal as well. And then finally, there's a National Wildlife Refuge, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. St. Mark's is a National Wildlife Refuge, and its sole purpose is conservation. It's purely for the nature. Now, of course, you can visit. It is open to visit. There's many of them have you know accessible roads um, that are just for the park, the, the, the refuge service to be able to get in and maintain and conserve, um, but also they allow folks to visit. Um, and so many of them don't even allow any camping, but St. Mark's is one of the few refuges that do allow camping. So we have our Florida National Scenic Trail, <clears throat> which is one of 11 federally designated National Scenic Trails. And it's a trail that goes from the Everglades all the way up to Pensacola Beach. It's about 1,100 miles end to end. There's some other offshoots of it, some different routes through the, through the middle of the state. So it's a total of about 1,400 miles. And uh, <clears throat> so I just wonder if anybody can tell 
us which of these types of national preserves the Florida Trail passes through. Anybody know any? You could take yourself off mute. I guess all of them. Yes. Can you name some? No. <laughs> Good guess, though. Anybody who's familiar with the Florida Trail? Juniper Wilderness. Yeah, Juniper Wilderness is a wilderness. It's a national wilderness. And that's in the middle of well, what? In the National, National Forest. In the National Forest. So we've got two National Forests. <clears throat> Florida Trail passes through the Ocala National Forest and the Osceola National Forest up, up close to us. Uh, the National Preserve is the uh, Big Cypress National Preserve. So maybe you all caught my, my presentation on hiking through Big Cypress. The Florida Trail goes through that. Um, and then there's a national seashore as well. So that's under that national parks designation. There's Gulf Shores, Island, Gulf Sea Island National Seashore, which is along Pensacola, that Santa Rosa beach there. And uh, so the Florida Trail goes along the beach there to Fort Pickens, which is part of that national seashore. And then finally, tonight, we're gonna talk about St. Mark's National Refuge. So a little bit about St. Mark's history. There's a lot to talk about here, so I'm going to whip through it pretty quick for you know for the time we have remaining. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's got a very long history. This whole area. It's a very rich area in wildlife and food sources, etc. Um, so it's been settled going back 10 or 11, 12,000 years by Paleo Indian societies. They aren't Indians on a Paleo diet, but they mean Indians, they probably were on a paleo diet, but they're the native peoples who were <clears throat> in prehistory. All we have is an archeological record of them. Um, and so they were succeeded by the Appalachian Indians who were here at the time of European settlement. They moved into the area about 1000 AD and they were a very advanced society <clears throat> for Florida Indians. They were, um, they built towns, they had, uh, you know, very, uh, very uh, mature art, agricultural societies. Uh, they live in uh, fixed housing with thatched, house, thatched roofs. And they did a lot of trade throughout the Americas. There's copper found there um, from the Midwest and uh, other artifacts from other areas of the country. And so uh, the Spanish came in around 1528, began to explore the area. Their first experience wasn't very good. They came in north of Tampa and hiked up through the coast and then ended up in this area where the Appalachians were in the St. Mark's area, as we call today. And then <clears throat> they uh, pretty much were starving by the time they reached the Appalachian Indians. So they kind of helped them and got them going. And then they beat all their guns and their shields and armor into nails and made ships, got back into a ship and sailed back to Tampa. And that was, that was the extent of it until DeSoto started to explore the area. And uh, so he then came up and <clears throat> met up with the Appalachians. They didn't get along too well. And then uh, he just left. He was just an explorer. But in the meantime, as we all know, since we live in St. Augustine, the Spanish were establishing permanent settlements um, on the East Coast and St. Augustine was established in 1565. And um, one of the purposes of the Spanish habitations were to establish um, missions and to convert the native people to Catholicism. And so they did that, established quite a few missions all around the, the Northern part of what's now Florida. And uh, the Appalachians supplied uh, food to St. Augustine. So they traded food for other goods that the settlers had, and, but they were very abundant agricultural producers. And so there was a lot of trade with the Appalachians and the Appalachians got interested in Catholicism and they actually requested there be a mission 
So the mission <clears throat> finally came to what is now Tallahassee, but at that time was the Appalachies um, capital, which was Anhaika. And that was in 1633, they established that mission. And it was a kind of an interesting arrangement um, because the mission was established right in the middle of the town, just like uh, it belonged there. And there were European settlers, Spanish people living there and they're right in the middle of the town with the Indians. And they ended up, you know, in some cases they took Indian wives. There was a mestizo population. It's called a mixed population there as well. And so it was kind of an interesting example of a, of a, you know, a shared township between Europeans and Native Americans. Um, <clears throat> and however, the Europeans really didn't get along too well. <laughs> As you know, your history on, on the European continent, there are a lot of wars fought during this period. So um, they had to think about <clears throat> how they could protect their settlements and their missions from other European powers. So they built a fort down in what is now St. Mark's. They called San Marcos de Apalachi. And that's where we get the name St. Mark's. That was in 1679. And uh, so the uh, British had established colonies in what we now know as you know, Georgia, South Carolina. And those were pretty much, as you know, they were slave economies. So there were uh, plantations and there were enslaved people who worked those plantations. Um, and so what would happen is the slaves would escape and they'd come across the border to Florida and the Spanish promised them that if, if they converted to Catholicism, that they would be freed. And so that attracted a lot of escaped slaves. So. Uh, we know that from St. Augustine because of Fort San Jose, San Jose here. That was, that was built for escaped slaves. And uh, in the same way, they would cross over and come over to St. Mark's. And so this created a lot of friction between the British colonies and later the American colonies and the Spanish. And what they used was the native peoples kind of as their proxies or as partners in their wars. So you had Indians and Europeans fighting each other across this border for probably uh, at least a hundred years <laughs> back and forth. And it uh, culminated in Queen Anne's War, which is 1702 to 1704. And that was the American version of the War of Spanish Succession on the continent. Uh, and it was British and Spanish fighting each other. And the Spanish finally gave up defending St. Mark's and they decided we're just getting out of here. It's not worth it and um, militarily at least, they left. <clears throat> and so the Appalachian were kind of outnumbered from their uh, invaders that would come across the border and decided they'd hightail it over to uh, Pensacola. They hit out in Pensacola. Then they went up to Mobile, Alabama. And finally, later in the 19th century, they went all the way to Louisiana and kind of hung out in the swamps and hid there for 200 years and just avoided any, any kind of contact with, what, with, uh, with uh, Americans, European settlers, right? And so just, you know, they would try to blend in. They would try not to appear, you know, dark skinned. They would try to wear clothes to cover themselves in the sun. And it was interesting, their kind of, their, their kind of exile in that period of time. And then finally in the 70s and 80s, when the American Indian movement got more powerful, they, they you know, wanted to be recognized and the federal government began to recognize the Indian tribes. And so they're still petitioning to be recognized as a legitimate Indian, Indian tribe. There's probably three or 400 left and their language is completely gone. In any case, that was uh, the Queen Anne's War and the result of that. <clears throat> And then the British and the Spanish kept fighting. And then the Indians kept fighting. The Seminoles were involved in this as well. At that time, they came into the area. And so then, as you know, Jackson, Andrew Jackson launched the uh, first Seminole War. And so in St. Mark's, <clears throat> Jackson came across to what was at that time Spanish territory 
Spanish at that time was neutral. And he um, basically arrested and tried on the spot two British nationals, Arbuthnot and Amberster, and uh, executed them in St. Mark's. So it was uh, another famous incident that happened in St. Mark's, kind of caused an international incident. But in the end, Spain, Spain just gave up dealing with all this and <laughs> ceded the territory to the United States in 1821. In 1845, Florida became a state. So <clears throat> the Americans built a lighthouse in 1831 uh, in the area. You can still see that lighthouse as you enter into the refuge, it's still there. And uh, then they also built a railroad. It was the third railroad that was built in the United States. It was built between St. Mark's and Tallahassee. And the reason was it was becoming a very big cotton port. So they'd move the cotton down and then transport it out of the port and into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, into the Caribbean. Um, <clears throat> and what they did is they ended up a few years later moving the, the port downstream, down the St. Mark's River. We'll show you that on the map as we go through this hike. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was a broader, deeper channel further down the river. And so it was just easier to get the big ships in and out. And so they built this Port Leon there. And then they built, they extended this railroad across the St. Mark's River, across a bridge, and all the way in several miles to Port Leon. But six years later, a big hurricane came and destroyed the entire town of Port Leon. So that was the end of Port Leon. And as you go through the trail and you cross the St. Mark's River, you can still see the bridge works, but of course no bridge still exists and no train tracks exist any longer. So then during the 1860s, <clears throat> there was the Civil War, Florida was on the Confederate side. There was, a, there was basically a, um, uh, an embargo or a, a uh, closing off of all the ports in the Confederacy by the US Navy. And so it was very difficult to get certain essential items. One of those essential items was salt because at that time there was no refrigeration. So how did you preserve your food? You preserved it with salt. So it was very important. It was very, it was very important for the war effort as well. So there was a big salt works that was established in St. Mark's in the 1860s. And again, you can go and see what remains of those salt works on the, on the refuge today. Um, they also had a big industry in naval stores, which is basically timber products and using that, <clears throat> the pine sap to make turpentine and uh, other products that are used in shipbuilding. Um, and so you can see those naval stores there as well today. And in the late 1800s, all the way up to the 1980s, there was this, uh, what's called a sen yard. And this is over in Goose Creek. And I'll show you that as we go through this hike as well. And uh, so it's a way of fishing where you just, you put a net over a current um, of water and uh, the fish swim into the net. And so it was a very popular way to do fishing in the bay from the late 1800s to, to up until the 1980s, they still used this vineyard. Um, in the 1920s, there was a, a hotel built there by a very wealthy farmer who had a lot of agriculture in, in, uh, in Florida, mostly a cattle raised, cattle farmer, cattle rancher. Um, and you could still see the foundation of that hotel as well on the refuge property. And then in 1931, St. Mark's was established as a migra migratory bird refuge, which then later became what's known as the National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, that was to protect migrating birds. It, this is the part of the uh, North American flyway between the Midwest and down through into the Caribbean and South America as birds make their migratory path each year. And so it was to help give them a refuge so they had a place to stay and eat and rest on the way. And uh, in the 30s, during the depression, most of you know about the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. Well, there was a civilian, a civilian Conservation Corps camp. And this was one of the few 
African American camps. In many cases, the uh, New Deal kind of skipped over or excluded African Americans. But in this case, this was uh, a camp where African Americans were um, brought in to help with that effort and paid, and they were able to send money home. And uh, they built the um, levees and the the pools that are used there for, um, you know, for attracting and retaining and feeding uh, the birds that come through. And so you'll see those as you hike through this park. And then in 75, this uh, 17,000 acres of St. Mark's were designated uh, federal wildlife. So a little bit about hiking through the refuge. Um, you can go 45 miles on the Florida Trail within the refuge. And it really is, of all the sections of the Florida Trail, the most diverse habitat of any section. Um, and it's also right next to the Asilla section on the east, which is about 22 miles, and the Apalachicola section on the west, which is about 66 miles. So with just a little bit of road walk, you can put together a 136 mile hike um, all through a wilderness area, which is kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> one thing to know if you're section hiking is that overnight parking is prohibited in the refuge. So it's a little tricky to get the parking. There are these areas <clears throat> that are available for parking and I'll point these out as we go through the hike. Um, <clears throat> only hikers who are gonna go all the way through the refuge are allowed to camp. And as I said, it's one of the few areas in uh, the country where a refuge allows, um, allows visitors to camp. And you can only camp in the designated campsites. You call this phone number to reserve the campsites or you can email them. And it's very reasonable. Camping fee is a dollar per person per night with a 20 camper limit. One thing to be aware of when you're hiking through this area is that water sources are very scarce. You've got to plan your water well. Um, Many of the creeks that run through used to be fresh water, but as the water level is rising, the sea level is rising, many of these are now turning brackish, particularly at high tide. So you want to taste the water before collecting it. And of course, as you know, we always filter our water before drinking it from wild sources. So that's a little bit about hiking it. So here's, <clears throat> here's what the St. Mark's Refuge looks like close up. And they divide it into these three administrative units. There's the St. Mark's unit, which is between the Eastern boundary and St. Mark's, St. Mark's town is over here. Then there's the Wakula unit, which is west of St. Mark's all the way to the Shell Point Road here. And then Panacea unit, which is the Eastern section. Okay, so let's just take a little walk here. So we'll hike through the, the, the preserve. I don't have a lot of time. Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna go from east to west. So um, there's a parking area here off of US 98. There's a little water source as you first come in. And then it's about 10 miles from there to this Ring Dyke Camp, which is a beautiful campsite right there on the bay. And then you can <clears throat> hike up here another few miles and you go past the, the road, you could take a, to go down to visit the shell mounds and the lighthouse. And you can also walk up here to see the salt works and the CCC. And you can go over here to the visitor center, which is again, one of your only water sources on the way through this part. Um, and so you have to get a little off the trail to see some of these historical things. But here's how the Cypress swamps look when you first enter the, the uh, Eastern section. Here's a bridge. This is an old railroad bridge over the pinhook. This was a tram that was used to, to carry all the agricultural product, the pine logs out of the forest. And here we are, as you're going through, <clears throat> this dips down towards the bay and you've got these beautiful vistas. You can actually see the big bend of Florida. You can see uh, to the left, you could see the peninsula and to the right, you could see the panhandle. And there's a beautiful ring dike camp. 
where you can camp right there by one of these conservation pools. And it's looking right out of the bay. And I have to show off with some beautiful photos of what I saw going to bed at night and waking up the next day. So proceeding along the next five miles or so, you're gonna go up <clears throat> to Port Leon. So you could go a little about a half mile past the trail here and you can see the ruins of Port Leon. And then you continue along here and go over the St. Mark's River and get into the town of St. Mark's itself. We'll show you a little bit of what that, what that looks like. And a lot of it's up on these levees along the, along the bay. And these levees are what were built by the CCC. Uh, October is uh, monarch butterfly migration. So, you know, tens of thousands of monarch butterflies come through this area, as well as all the migratory birds. I came through in early November, so I saw a few still remaining. Beautiful salt marsh coming back from Port Leon, and then you're hiking along the rail bed. And when you get to the St. Mark's River, guess what? There's no bridge. <laughs> There's no way to get across this river except by boat. <clears throat> uh, it's, this current's too swift. It's probably only about 50 yards. We're looking at the other side. We're looking at the Port Leon side from the St. Mark side. So what you have to do is flag down a boat. Just you know, get out there and start waving and someone will pick you up and bring you across. Or you could arrange it with a, uh, with a fishing charter camp that's there's also there called Shell Point and they'll give you a ride for 25 bucks. Then you get into St. Mark's and then you go along what's a bike trail between St. Mark's and, uh, and Tallahassee. And so we veer off of that bike trail when we get up to US 98 again. But all, most of this area would be along this, this paved bike trail. So you're gonna be going up here. Then the bike trail continues to Tallahassee, but we take a left and go along Coastal Highway and we go over the uh, Wakula River and then you're going back into the forest again. Here's a little picture going across the Wakula River, going down US 98 Coastal Highway. And we go back into the forest. There's a campsite, good place to camp. There's a kind of utility section uh, of, for where the Florida Wildlife Commission and also the refuge staff keep offices and they keep equipment there. And this is a water source. You can go behind that building there and there's a spigot and you can get some water there. This is the most beautiful area. I'm gonna show you this really quickly. Um, there's parking here, there's water here, and then you go along a road for a couple miles and then you just dip back down in the forest again. This is just a forest road. It's not a big traffic road. Then you go through these two beautiful areas called Cathedral Palms and Severed Spring. I'm gonna show you those. First you go through a cypress swamp, go on the forest road, and then you get into this cathedral of palms. Everywhere you look, as far as you can see, there's palm trees. Just a gorgeous thing. You really feel this majestic feeling. Here's a little bit more of the cathedral. And then right after that, you come up on this beautiful shepherd's spring and there's a little boardwalk you can walk out and take a look, sit, sit on a bench there and just kind of contemplate this beautiful spring. Last time I was there, there were little baby crocodiles swimming around in there. And finally, there's the Panacea unit. This is mostly, this is some, some, some swampy areas, but mostly, particularly on this side, it's all uh, the uh, kind of high pines and, and pinelands. Now here, <clears throat> there is a detour because there's a bridge out over Spring Creek here and it hasn't been replaced. So it's pretty dangerous to come through here. This mud, mud and muck is, can just, it's almost like quicksand. So you don't wanna go through here until they've repaired that bridge. So you have to take a little road walk. And so this is what that looks like. First going through the pine flatwoods. And then here's the sign. <clears throat> the sign only works when you're going east to west for some reason. <laughs> coming, when you're coming from the west, that's, they don't have the sign in that section. So some people unwittingly get stuck in that section and have to turn around. And here's a little uh, kind of a attraction on the road along the way, <laughs> the local uh, humor. And then finally, these pine flatwoods, you can see some of the beautiful pine lens in the refuge. And 
basically a couple trailheads at the end where you can park or disembark from the, the refuge. And that's it for St. Mark's.